Thank you again for the honor of the podium. And this, these are my disclosures. As discussed earlier, I um, will be giving this discussion on training. When you think about the training and where we are started, the robot started in the mid 2000s with the standard, as you see there, and it grows to many other types of robots. This clicker is not working up here. There's the SI. Let's see here. Next slide, please. XI, next slide. And on with the XI and even newer robots like Senhance. Next slide again. And the new Med Robotics Flex robot. Uh, no, it's working? No, okay, people have been using it. Sorry about that. So when you see such advanced technology, you're trying to think to yourself, how can you get trained in so many levels? So my own personal story is that I started doing lap colon resections and general surgery, doing hand assist surgery with Dave Vargas over, who's now at Oshner. I loved hand assist. I thought it was the next new wave of doing surgery to avoid large incisions, and then we wrote papers on it. In fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, I was exposed to an advanced amount of procedures, and I did a second, a second fellowship in advanced laparoscopic colorectal surgery with Connor Delaney at Case Western. And as an attending, I do 90% of my procedures robotic. So I spent so many years learning all these different techniques. And you're, you're kind of thought that that's the exact problem that our residents are running into now. And it's only going to get worse with the newer technologies coming in, now multifold. So how can we train in this setting? Well, honestly, it has to be multi-tiered. The training has to be at every single level and lifelong. And I'm going to give examples of all the training, in, at least with robotics, and how we're doing this. I think it's important to start education at the medical student level, then going to the surgical residents, the fellows, and of course, as you're attending. So why would you do medical students? Why, why would you do it? Well, some of these stu students will go into surgery. So it's important for them to see different modalities. And some of them are going to be referral sources. So these upcoming referral sources should understand why robotics is being used and the, the appropriate application on it. Um, also, honestly, medical students are great for research. They have a year to work with you. They have a very um, focused time to impress you for a recommendation, and they get it done. I love working with my residents, but sometimes when they're looking at uh, outlook of I graduate in six years, they don't think about a deadline a week later. Um, but of course, not, not the residents in the room. They're, they're great. So uh, mentorship starts early. So here is a variety of papers, all based on robotics, based on training medical students. Because honestly, it was easier to find a bunch of medical students to volunteer to come in on the weekend to do research projects than it was the residents at this time. So after you get these medical students engaged, obviously the main focus is going to be someone like residents. So the surgical residents are our future surgeons. It's important to show them a broad number of techniques and technologies. Training them will help you as well in the operating room. So it's multifold. We were talking about learning curves and operative time. And, and basically, my operative time is plateaued. I'm not going to get be as fast as Jorge, because the truth is, is that my residents are my learning curve. And what they do is the operative time. But they're the only one in the room who we're training, fortunately. And we do a decent job of it. But it's important to get these residents trained in basic robotics, or every case is going to be terrible. At GW, we have a two-track curriculum. I'm sure Jamie will uh, very recognize a lot of this, because this is from her program. Um, not everyone's interested in robotics. So the first track, actually, uh, was just all residents to promote safety at the bedside and education. The second track is for people who would like to have a letter demonstrating their proficiency. The track one, everyone does the training, quarterly robotics lectures that we give. We do bedside assists. We talk about modules. And we even get them on the console. Even if you're going to go into plastic surgery, I'll get you on the console so long as you've done some basics and you feel comfortable. Just because I, I, I enjoy using the system and I and let the pass that joy on to them. And you never know when that plastic surgery robot's around the corner. So it's good to educate everyone. Track two is much more um, uh, in depth. Um, we talk about getting advanced modules, 
console surgeons for about 20 cases. And now with my practice and general surgery and other hospital systems doing robotics, they can get these 20 cases. Um, now, this is the didactic curriculum, which is very long and wordy. Um, but it's basically showing you what we're looking at. And the practical skills we're looking at at each level, PG1, one, one through four, trying to get them through various levels so by the time they're chief, they're good to go. Um, again, these are the metrics we're doing. Now, we also have a simulator. We're looking at different types of activities on the simulator for the basic first degree and then the second degree as well. So really, at the end of their surgical training, if you've met these requirements and are competent, you will be getting a letter demonstrating their proficiency. And here's a letter from Intuitive saying that. And now, I can't say that a credentialing office in a different hospital will say you don't need to do any extra training. That's all based on the local credentialing process. But what can happen is, is if you have a letter, they may say, it's okay, well, we don't need, you don't need to do a course, which is $5,000. You don't need to waste time doing an observer. We trust you because of the numbers that you have. We'll just have somebody observe you do a few cases, and you've bypassed it and made your life easier. And on top of it, when you're applying for a job, and you can say, look, I've been trained in robotics, and they're like, really, what do you mean by that? Well, here's my diploma, and here's my numbers. Again, the, the surgeon or the applicant that has more training in different areas may help you get a, a good job. Now, the general surgeries, surgeons, is what I've really focused on, but training fellows is extremely important. We have Dr. Cleary here, who's also been very involved in it. And honestly, when your fellows are looking at programs, they're going to look at programs that provide it all. They don't want to look at a program that only does open or only does lap. They're going to want a program that does open, lap, robotic. It makes sense. And so I think it's important that our fellowship programs recognize this and nurture the young surgeons who are doing robotics, et cetera. And besides your own individual fellowship program, there are outside resources, such as the Association of Program Directors and Colon and Rectal Surgery, hot off of Twitter. Here's a photo of Dr. Saliman, Dr. Bostaros, training the, the colorectal fellows just a few days ago down in Sunnyvale. Um, and they trained 64 fellows this year. They've done a great job. And this is, what, their third or fourth year doing it. So we've got a high penetration rate, including industry, to help us. Now, just like me coming out of residency, I didn't have any of that. And I had to start here, training as an attending. I was fortunately able to see some tissue labs, various com companies sponsored training like at ba basic plus and advanced courses, and also further learning at societies like at SAGES and ASCRS, where they're having live courses uh, and, and cadaver courses taught by experts um, on various techniques. So societies like SAGES are really great for teaching. And of course, after training is done, simulation helps keep skills um, up to date, simulation is ethical, it helps in work hour restriction, you can use it at any time, you can do your crisis management, it was asked earlier, um, and it's, it's actually, um, OR teaching is actually more expensive, so if you can take the teaching out of the OR, you're going to save some time. Here are some quick papers, just talking about how the mimic training with the Da Vinci simulator actually uh, had a strong correlation uh, with other types of training, and it was a good tool for basic skills. And here's another paper that looked at a randomized trial with 51 participants, um, either using the VR simulator or reading a book for 10 minutes. And uh, of course, if you did the simulator, you did better than reading a random book. Um, so in conclusion, I wanted to mention that we have to keep up with the new technology. All the speakers today are talking about the new tech. All week long, Sages is on the cutting edge of new technology. It is a lifelong learning process. We have to learn from multiple resources, and we have to have an open mind in new technology. And quite honestly, new technology is going to be coming to teaching as well. Here's Dr. Maki Sugimoto, who gave a presentation this Wednesday at the Sage's New Gadgets and Gizmo session. If anyone saw it, he's do using virtual reality to have a 3D visualization in front of him of a liver that he's rotating out and showing where the lesion is truly cutting edge stuff that you're seeing. So again, thank you for allowing me to speak on teaching and training the current and new generation.